I'm going to be talking to Carter Lee of Switch Energy, whose company has a pilot project in downtown Toronto, where they're going to charge a Nissan Leaf uh, during off hours, off peak hours, and then uh, make that energy available to an office building during on peak hours. Kind of a deep project. So welcome to the interview, Carter. Thanks for having me, Marco. Well, look, uh, give us an overview of your, uh, your project, please. Sure. So this is a pilot project in, in collaboration with the IBI Group, as well as Slate Asset Management. IBI Group is the technology partner that we've been uh, working with for the past two, three years on smart buildings and smart cities um, technology platforms. And Slate Asset Management is the host and the owner of the building. So, you know, really appreciated the, uh, the support from both IBI and Slate in, in this project. Um, the project itself is focusing on how to integrate electric vehicles into the built environment. You know, um, a big challenge for the widespread adoption of electric vehicles is uh, allowing people who live in high density urban settings in cities, you know, um, to own an electric vehicle because they don't have a place to charge regularly. And the most convenient locations to charge electric vehicles is either at home or at work, you know, in these large high density buildings. The challenge to put in electric vehicle charging infrastructure within these buildings is that, you know, there's not enough electrical infrastructure capacity to really uh, provide an abundant amount of EV charging uh, infrastructure. So we're focused on not only, you know, putting it in, but how it can scale uh, effectively when more and more people own electric vehicles uh, in the future. You know, you might be able to start off with most buildings can deal with five or 10 charging stations currently, but what happens when, you know, half the cars are now electric and you need 20, 30, 40, 50 charging stations? You know, it presents a huge challenge in the electrical capacity. You have to upgrade electrical panels, your conduits, et cetera, but also on the energy costs of the building as well, you know. Um, right now, most large buildings um, have a, um, a peak energy um, uh, consumption uh, cost associated to their electricity bills. You know, the concept is that 99% of the time energy is really, really cheap, but there's 1% of the time it's really expensive. So, you know, for us, it's really about putting it all together and using vehicle to grid to make it uh, more cost effective and easy for real estate developers to, to integrate that solution. Right, that, that's a great explanation of the, of the issue, the problem here that you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. uh, but walk us through on a, on a practical basis. Imagine, you know, describe for us how this would work. I drive in with my Nissan Leaf. Is it charged already or do I have to charge it, uh, mm -hmm. at, you know, at the building and then leave it there? Uh, I mean, how does this work? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and that's ultimately the biggest challenge is to provide incentives, you know, for drivers to participate in these programs, right? It's like, why should me as a, as a, just an employee at this office building, I have a Nissan Leaf, why am I potentially giving out energy, right? So, you know, the idea is that we want to be able to tie in everybody so that they're financially incentivized to participate in this program. You know, um, if I'm going to be able to give energy to the building and the, ener the building is able to save a lot of money from reducing their peak energy demand, then I should be able to be compensated. And, and that's part of our uh, system and our platform of like how to effectively compensate uh, the usage of uh, their batteries. Another challenge and why there's a blockchain component to this um, project is, um, you know, because this is within a building, um, usually energy metering and transactions are monitored by the utilities. And we trust the utilities because they've been doing that for you know, over, a hundred, uh, over a century to, to kind of track energy and, and build them uh, accordingly. But when you're kind of shifting energy behind the meter, behind the fence, as they call it, um, they have no visibility to that. So we need a third party that can you know, reliably and securely track these transactions so that you know, if, me as a Nissan Leaf driver, I give about $5 worth of electricity back to the building that there's an independent party that can track that and ma make sure that there's no funny business going on around that system. Right. Well, that makes perfect sense to me because and I've had this raised by engineers, actually, who say, you know, because we were talking in that context within, let's say, a neighborhood, right? So the utility wants to use my EV uh, battery during the night. 
uh, and well, where's my financial incentive to let you do that? You know, let yeah. the utility do that. And how do I get compensated? And if it's just pennies on the dollar, or it's a couple of bucks a month, you know, why would I bother? I mean, I'm letting them charge and discharge my battery. There's probably some degradation there. You know, am I really being compensated? So I guess I gather that the pilot project that you're undertaking is sort some of that stuff out. Let's see how it works and what kind of data we get back. Exactly, exactly. You know, um, and, we, you know, we'll see how, how uh, you know, willing, uh, you know, the, the employees are on that. But I think there's also other ways to kind of get a V to G within a building as well. I mean, obviously, we'd like to have, um, you know, visitors, re uh, employees, residents, all these people to participate in, a, in on a regular basis. But there's also other ways to have V2G uh, be utilized. And one way is through uh, fleet vehicles, you know, and within like say an office building, I mean, I don't mean like a giant, uh, like a really large uh, fleet deployment, but rather, you know, maybe there's a few security guard vehicles that they use anyways, you know, for their day-to-day -day use. And for the majority of the times those security, uh, you know, uh, vehicles are, you know, just sitting there being parked. So that, incentive structure because it's already owned by the buildings themselves already like the, the vehicles themselves it's easier to manage the willingness to to kind of have them plugged in and be discharged as a battery um, another um, scenario that we're working on right now with another a pilot is that we're using um, uh, car sharing vehicles um, to, to to participate in these programs again because the car sharing company can have direct control over the access the, of the stations. But we know that there's like one or two hours of the month or the year that we really need the um, you know, peak demand to be reduced. They can block off that time so people are not necessarily able to like use it and, and make sure that there's a battery around it as well. So yeah, like the pilot in itself is really trying to discover all the different incentive structures to, to be able to maximize vehicle to grid use. Now, one of the things I found in interviewing uh, experts about uh, evolving e electricity grids, because we're expecting that, you know, over the next 30 years, we're going to need two or three times the amount of electricity. We're going to have all these, you know, electric vehicles and heat pumps and all, you know, and we need to be a lot smarter about how we manage all of that. And it seems like this is really interesting because when I talk to those experts, we're talking at a very high level, you know, the utility scale. And now here we are down at the consumer scale, you know, trying to figure out how to make that work. So are you working with any, you know, the, uh, the utility that serves this building? Uh, are they part of the project? Yeah, so Toronto Hydro, um, you know, was uh, is part of this program because they need to ensure that because this is bi-directional, uh, the, the electricity could, could go up, that there's a lot of safety mechanisms in place to to for that to happen. So Toronto Hydro for this specific pilot was very active in, 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 in kind of making sure everything was nice and properly set up. Um, and that will go for probably for most vehicle to grid um, projects because of the uh, the ability of the energy being able to be flown back into the grid. Um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the concept of about working in conjunction with utilities is, is very important because, you know, for them, they're the ones who are coordinate, coordinating all the demand response kind of uh, controls of like, oh, we need to turn down, you know, hundreds of, you know, kilowatts of energy at a certain area right now. How do they do that? So it's really important that we have direct um, API connections with each other so that they were able to respond to these um, grid needs as quickly as possible. So when you're talking to the utilities, uh, I mean, the utility uh, demand management, so where the utility has some sort of control over, you know, if, if we're talking about the consumer, uh, when there's a lot of demand, they turn down your, your thermostat by four degrees, uh, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And we see that in the states a lot. I mean, California in particular is is implementing in a big way because they've got big problems. But in in Canada, there doesn't seem to be or hasn't seemed to be up to now a lot of interest in demand management at the utility scale. Are you seeing that from from uh, your uh, utility partner? We are. I mean, in in in, in Ontario itself, you know, distribution, um, generation, and transmission are kind of separated it out. So. You know, like from the Toronto Hydro perspective, they were more concerned about the you know the safety components. But for the trans the transmission and the ISOs, like in Ontario, it's the IESO. They're very very involved in um, kind of uh, 
leveraging all the distributed energy resources, you know, like solar panels, electric vehicles and stuff. And they've actually built a consortium um, recently about how to, you know, uh, maximize distributed energy resources. And so a part of this project I, I should have mentioned is actually, you know, funded by the IESO and around um, how quickly we can respond to their demand response signals as part of their global adjustment uh, program. Yeah. Well, very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So give us a sense of the timeline here. Uh, how long will a pilot project last? How long do you expect to be able to scale up and go commercial with this? Yeah, it's a great question. So the pilot itself is total three years where you know, we just completed the first year. So we have another two years left. And then the majority of the time for the next two years is really tracking um, be, you know, charging behavior and the ability to kind of discharge that energy from the uh, vehicle, the grid chargers, and as well as slow down all the other chargers and see, you know, when we do get a price signal or a market signal from the IESO to turn down our charging or energy by 50%, how quickly can we do it and how effectively can we do it? And that'll be really key because uh, the concept is when there's tens of thousands of ch vehicles charging simultaneously in, in, in Ontario and in British Columbia and other regions, like that will be key to be able to respond to grid, grid demand um, because, uh, you know, electric vehicles is very unique that it's not binary in that you have to turn it on or off. You can slow it down and there's not a huge detriment to the whole experience for the EV drivers as long as they get a full charge by the end of their dwell period. Now, just to finish up the interview, Carter, um, you young entrepreneur in a, in a startup, uh, it's really exciting in this in this space. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and how you, uh, you know, why you started at Switch Energy. Uh, are you an engineer or uh, some other kind of technologist? Uh, what's your what's your story? Yeah, so my story is was that I was always um, very passionate about sustainability. I did ecology and biology for my undergrad. Um, I was, you know, essentially um, for all my undergrad thesis was a um, was a marine biology project in, in Panama City, Panama, with the in the Panama Canal. So I've always wanted to find a, a I guess a, a an avenue to to really uh, work on sustainability issues. And for me, you know. Um, after doing my PhD, um, it was really looking for the right opportunity. And, uh, you know, all, obviously with an entrepreneurial perspective as well, because I come from a family of entrepreneurs. And, um, you know, after doing a couple of years of management cons consulting, um, I was living in a downtown apartment in Toronto, and I wanted an electric vehicle. And I really just uh, firsthand experienced the difficulties of trying to own an electric vehicle in these high density urban settings. Cause I talked to my condo uh, manager, I talked to my property manager, the condo board, and it was just impossible. This was 2016 at the time. So nowadays it's a little easier, but you know, I, I realized quickly at that point that if we were to have this mass adoption of electric vehicles that we needed to solve this urban uh, problem. So that was really the genesis of Switch. Well, Carter, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. And well, thanks. Thanks again for having me, Markham.